When you think you're a mess, just remember a mind. Cause it's time, just look at the signs. Black men. Hi, everyone. My name is Lady Rhoda, and I'd like to officially welcome you all to the Spirit Kitchen, where all your questions will be answered. So before we go into the questions, I kindly ask that you share the link to all your social media platforms so as to reach as many people as possible. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your comments in the comment section below. So now let's just delve straight into the question. I have yeah. Commander L here with me. So Commander, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Lady Rhoda. I'm doing good. Great, great, yes, great. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I'm excited to be here as usual, and I'm sure everybody is excited too. So as Lady Rhoda said, um, let's do all to share. There's somebody out there who needs a session um, because practical questions will be answered and I'm sure we'll be done in the next 30 minutes. So I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Commander, first question. So Commander, how does one draw a balance between studying and growing in the knowledge of God? Okay. Um, a balance between studying, yes. as in like academic, academic studies yes, and in the knowledge of God. Um, when, when you listen to, I preached a sermon on time management. Okay. okay. When you listen to the sermon on, on, on time management, um, I, I, I made a, a comparison over there with regards to the number of things in our lives that are relevant to our success, to our purpose, to our relaxation, so on and so forth. And I stated in there that Interestingly, the average human being spends more time on things that don't practically contribute to their progress in life. Okay. All right. So a lot of time is spent on things that are not practically relevant. Then the little time that is left, then we try to scramble for it and then try to um, see how best we can make that. We can make the important things fit within the little time that we have left. So in terms of balancing your relationship between God and then studying academically, I don't think it is much of a problem. Think about it. In a day, we have 24 hours. Say 12 hours of the 24 hours is used for resting and extracurricular activities. You have 12 more hours. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Say um, eight out of those 12 hours is dedicated to academia, which is normally not the case. So but say eight out of those 12 hours is dedicated to academia. Then that means you have four solid hours left. Four solid hours where you can actually spend two out of those solid hours in your relationship with God in specialized times of prayer or Bible study. But aside that, it's important to know that, you see, in our relationship and in our work with God, one of the reasons why people don't push as hard as they can and people don't have that fluid flow in terms of a relationship with God is because normally people are looking for segregated time to spend with God. When actually every single moment of the day can be spent in fellowship with him. Wow. Yeah. Remember God told Joshua in Joshua 1 8, he said that this book of the law should not depart out of your mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night. You see, so something like meditation, when you take a scripture and you are meditating on it, um, brooding over it, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in class and when nothing is happening, you can be meditating on scripture. The lecturer can even say something that connects to a scripture and you are meditating on it. And anytime you fix your mind on God, you start to stir up the spirit. Because in the realm of the spirit, your mind works like a cell phone. Mm. Whatever you think about, whatever you brood on, you connect with the thing. Wow. You see? So, I mean, in your actual day, if you want to make separate time aside for God, you still have more than enough time. But just in case that is also not a good enough concept for you, then you actually have the opportunity to just fellowship with God throughout the day. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. So, I mean, it's not a problem at all. Wow. wow. Thank you so much, Commander. Yeah. Um, so, Commander, what's your take on tattoos and piercing? Tattoos and piercing? Yes, please. This, if we take top 10 questions that have repeated themselves over and over and over again. Mm. This question is like number three on the list. <laughs> yeah. What is your take on tattoos and piercing? Um, well, first of all, 
we learn a great deal about God's character, his preferences, from God's dealings with the people in the Old Testament. And of course, in the Old Covenant, we know that God was not in for tattoos. Yes, yes, that's true. All right. But in the New Testament, one of the things that we need to understand is that there is a commission that has been given to everyone to reach out to the space and the world around them. That is why the Bible talks about in Timothy that we should be of good reports to even outsiders. That means that probably um, having a piercing as a guy on my ear may not necessarily be violating any law in the New Testament. But the thing is that of what report will it be to the society that I currently live in? You see, once the thing is not leading to any edification, once it's not edifying, it's not building up the body, it's not building up you in any way, then I don't think it's something to focus on. The Bible says that all things are permissible, but not all things are edified. In other words, there are so many things that in the New Testament you can do. But the question is, how does it benefit you or other people? Yeah. Somebody may say that um, I pierce because I look good in the piercing. There is no problem with that. You look good in the piercing, fine, you can pierce. But then again, we still have to ask the question. Because the primary law by which we run in the New Testament is as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. So would you say that the motivation for having that piercing had anything to do with God? If it had something to do with God, that's great. I don't have a problem with it. But if it had nothing to do with God, the motivation was just the last of the eyes. The Bible says these three things run the world. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. If the only reason why you went to pierce was because of the last of the eyes, then you are 100% guaranteed that the consequence, the effect, the fruit of that will be negative. You see, so piercing in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. But motive counts, what inspired you counts, and then the society that you are in also counts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So about the piercing and the tattoos, especially the tattoos, people are of the view that people who have tattoos will not go to heaven. Do you think that's true? That cannot be true. Okay. It will not be true. The moment that is true, scripture is broken. Wow. You know, in John chapter 3, Jesus said that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Right? So, we have to understand that this body will be changed. What guarantees you access into the kingdom of God is not necessarily this body, mm. but it is what happens to your spirit man. Being born again and your access into God's kingdom is not as a result of physical regulations you obey. Wow. It is because of your faith in Jesus. The fact that you had a debt to pay. Jesus Christ came to pay for you, so believe it. That is it. That is what grants you access into the kingdom of God. So, if, if somebody has a, a tattoo, it won't take them to hell. It is unbelief that takes people to hell. They're not believing in the Lord. You get it. Yeah. Uh -huh. However, as I said, the question is, if you have a tattoo, does it edify? Does it build you up? The society you are living in, does, does it permit that? You know, and then also the Bible says that if you do anything that will violate the conscience of younger believers, it is better you don't do it. So if right now as a commander, I have a tattoo on my hand or I go and get a piercing and it will cause a lot of confusion among so many believers, then God says, commander, it's better you don't do it. Mm. You understand? So that's my take on that. Wow. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, commander. Yes. Yes. Some time ago, you said that a person can trade their spiritual gifts for physical graphic graphification. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Physical hey. graphication. <laughs> 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 gratification. I mean, 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 I Flo, I will not laugh. <laughs> so you mentioned some time ago that a person is able to trade their spiritual gifts for yeah. physical gratification yeah. through sexual indulgence. Yeah. So um, when they repent, is there a way these gifts could be restored or can they actually be restored? Okay. 
So, so I remember very well the, the scenario, the illustration I was given was with regards to, um, uh, what's his name? Jacob and Esau. Yeah. You know, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's brother, um, Jacob went to his brother Esau and, and or Esau rather came to Jacob and said he was so hungry, so he wanted stew. Jacob said in response to that question, that, that requ requirement that, I would only give you some of this if you should trade your birthright to me. Now, Esau was ignorant of spiritual things. He didn't understand their power in words. And he said, yes, yes, what is birthright? Somebody is dying of hunger, you say birthright. <laughs> you understand? And so he took the stew with his mouth affirming that he has traded his birthright. Before I answer the question, a lot of people have to understand that it is ignorance of spiritual, ignorance of the spiritual. That makes people use their mouth to say certain things. Like a young girl, an elderly man or somebody says, that's my wife. Oh. And then you just casually say, oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these things are spiritual. Don't joke with them. The person may not have any spiritual intention behind it. But for the fact that words have been released, there is something that has happened. Mm. Don't be surprised one day if you, you, you enter into a relationship and for some strange reason, your man is, 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 is just not trusting you. He feels there's somebody there. You are not telling him. Sometimes these things are not, they are not just as a result of actions. It's because of things that have been said. Wow. The same for the guys. You see some old woman saying, Niku, no, 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 that's my <laughs> husband. And then you see guys just laugh about it. It's like, oh yeah, that's my wife. Or that's my sweet mommy. No. You have to be careful. Words, words, words mean a lot. And words can cause a lot. Okay, so Esau just agreed to the birthright thing. When he agreed to the birthright thing, <laughs> if you will notice, when they were given the genealogy of Jesus, they didn't even mention his name in there. Mm. That means that the moment he agreed to that thing, even heaven agreed that you have lost it. That is all. So, it's not a surprise that his father blessed Jacob. That's how the story had to play out. Because the guy had abandoned, he, he let go of something spiritual. Later on, the Bible tells us to not be spiritual fornicators like Esau. Wow. Who, because of his ignorance, like, right, he traded something spiritual for something material. So normally, when we indulge in the physical, in material, in fleshly things, especially sexual immorality, what happens is that sometimes you numb giftings, Sometimes you trade giftings. Sometimes you even lose them. Wow. The Bible says the gift and callings of God are without repentance. Meaning that when, assuming this, this is God, right? Yeah. I'm God. And then I give you this phone. God will not say, I've changed my mind. I'm taking my phone back. When God gives a gift, he doesn't change his mind about it. But is it possible for you to drop the phone? Yes. yes. Is it possible for you to lose the phone? Yes. yes. So people normally mistake that to mean that when God gives you a gift, it can never be lost. He will never take it back. But as for the gift, you can numb the gift, you can quench the gift, you can lose the gift. But I love one thing that Paul told Timothy. He says, stir it up. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Once the seed of the gift is still there, there is always a probability to stir it up again. Yeah. Another thing is that, can I take another vision of the Lord? And in that vision, the Lord told him, I'm giving you a mighty, mighty gift for healing. But there are times where you, you notice the gift is down or it's gone completely. He said, anytime that happens, wait on me until the gift comes back. So it is possible for gifts to go, but it is also possible for gifts to be restored. Wow. Waiting on God is the key. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So waiting on God, this, this phrase, waiting on God, what exactly does it mean? Because people think that wait on God is to just like uh, the disciples in the upper room, the 12 disciples waiting for the Holy Ghost to come and pray. What exactly do you have to do to wait on God? So, normally when people say waiting on God, there are two references basically to it. Okay. First of all, waiting on God means that um, I'm waiting for God to give me an answer concerning something. Okay. Right? So, life moves on. Not until God says something, I'm not going to take any decision. So, I'm waiting on God concerning the matter. So they keep praying about it. They keep talking to God about it, waiting for a confirmation in their spirit. But the other meaning to the waiting on God is 
to dedicate time aside to go and seek the face of God concerning something. Right? Both are necessary. There are times where you need to take a major decision. Sometimes we rush too much in taking decisions. You have to learn to be patient. You have to learn to be calm. You have to learn to receive a green light in your spirit to know that, Charlie, this thing I need to do it. And waiting is not wasting time if God hasn't given an answer. Mm. You see? So God hasn't given you a go ahead. He hasn't also said, don't go. He hasn't said, go. It's like everything is just quiet. Sometimes it's better to be still. You remember he said, be still and know that I am God. So sometimes it's just better to be still. And that process of stillness, that season of stillness, is something we can term as waiting on God. Then that number two, which I'm saying is dedicating special time aside, which is to say, I'm going away for three days. I'm going away for four days. Or even though I'm around, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm studying the word of God for the next two, three days so that I am clear on this matter before I move. So those are the two, two, two references to waiting on God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Commander. All right. All right. So if one is to find themselves in a situation mm-hmm. where they have to choose between normal employment okay. and then talents, what would you suggest that a person should do? Normal employment and talent? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I am sure you mean like maybe playing football, basketball, something uh, versus yeah. going to school. Yeah. Or versus getting a job. Yeah, this, this is also a, a very practical question. Um, strangely, normally, right, if anybody will be very honest, normally, talent doesn't pay well from the beginning. Yeah, so true. Normally, it takes a while to be doing in good talent before it starts to pay. Mm. But the truth of the matter is that you need that pay to be able to live. Mm. You get it? Yeah. Life is run by finances and you need the finances so why don't you get a job let that job sustain you on the side build your talent gradually until the talent is able to cater for you then you leave the job okay wow. right wow. that's one option sometimes people are in situations where the way the talent is is not something they can do on the side you see that you go all in or you are all out. When it comes to situations like that, I would say speak to somebody, speak to a counselor, speak to somebody. Okay. Weigh the options you have, weigh the pros and cons. Because a lot of times to take big moves and to get big results, you need to make big sacrifices. Yeah. So i will tell the person, weigh the pros and cons and take the decision. Just go all out into it. Make sure that you are going into it not with the mindset that 50 50 is that i'm going all out into it i will do well you understand yes. so that is that is what i'll say that is what i'll say normally the standard is that be on a job that can sustain you until your talent is big enough to sustain you but if you are faced with an opportunity where you have to go all out for your talent then i'll say weigh the pros and cons and if you will do it don't look back just go into it all out. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the next question, Commander, is taking weed a sin? <laughs> we know. <laughs> Infusion, no. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've had this question a lot. I don't know why weed smokers don't want us to talk about weed. <laughs> I don't know why they hate so much to hear that there's something wrong about weed. I don't know why. You know. But let's take, for example, the Bible says that don't be drunk with wine. The question is, what is wrong with wine? Is anything wrong with wine? No. There's nothing wrong with wine. But coming to a place where you are intoxicated, coming to a place where you are not sober, It's something God doesn't like. Mm. God doesn't like it when something else is in control of you. Not just weed, not just alcohol. But even if it is love, when you get to a place where you are in love and the love is what is controlling you, you are no longer in control of yourself. The will of God is no longer your priority. The love becomes your priority. It's it's something that does not please the Lord. 
Yeah. So, you know, the Bible says, be sober and be vigilant. Mm. If you are taking weed out, you fulfill that scripture. <laughs> I mean, the truth of the matter is that it is the fact that you are not in control of yourself that we don't like. The Bible is against that completely. Uh, so once you be taking weed and then it gets to a point where you are not in control of yourself, something else now becomes the motivation for life. Something else now becomes the directing force for life. Something else, it steals away your ability to reason in a sober state. No, the Bible is against it. Not only with anything else that has that effect. So yes, of course, the Bible is against taking weed because of the effect it leaves. Wow, thank you so, so much, yes. Commander. Yes. So we'll be taking our final question. All right. Are you ready? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. So Commander, if you are given the opportunity to share something to the young people of this generation, what would you like to say to them? Okay. Um, if I was given the opportunity yeah. to say something to the young people of the generation. Yes, please. Well, I'll tell them this. I'll tell them that they shouldn't repeat the mistakes of the fathers. Hmm. We have just one shot at life. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes that there is no work, no labor. There is no purpose in the grief where we are going to. So we just have one shot at life. Uh, we have just one opportunity to do life. So let's do it well. Um, don't use your life as an experiment. When the Creator sent you here, you weren't sent as an experiment. So don't come and experiment yourself. Um, I mean, you don't go to school to study every course. You go to school to study a course. Uh, the same way, don't decide that your life should be a space where you want to experiment everything. I want to try this. I want to see how it feels like to do this. I want to try this. Everybody's doing this. The fact that everybody is doing medicine, everybody you know is doing medicine, doesn't mean you should also go and do it, right? You stick to what you can do when it comes to academia. academia. So I think you should apply the same principle to life itself. Don't just jump into things because people are doing it. You weren't called to do everything. The creator sent you here for an assignment. You just have one shot at doing it. Do it with all your heart. Do it as well as you can. Do it very strongly. Let's make sure we don't repeat the mistakes of the fathers. And uh, let's make sure when the next generation comes, they'll be grateful that we lived. Yes, that's what I'd say. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. So as we heard, we have just one shot at life. Yeah. Life is not an experiment. So we have to do our best. We have to do and do it well. We have to do what we're called to do and do it very well. Thank you so, so much, Commander. Welcome, Lady Yoda. All right, and thank you all for joining us today. I would also ask that you kindly share the link to everyone so that they can at least rewatch it again. Yes, and also, I'll see you all next week, Monday, on another episode of The Spirit. Thank you all so much for joining in. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> We'll see what we can if we try. We conquer the plan and we conquer, we fight. We're Africans in Africa, it's time. No more time with the guns. Rising with the gang. Let's build on the road, but still we stand. Let us judge what we have seen. Reason for states of being. I see a king, I see a queen. We are standing with a helper. Women now is a helper. Interfering with our culture. They have mimicked, they have mocked us. They stole us and they robbed us. Open names and all our options. Trying to find another way out. To run away, yeah, we found another way out. Yeah, this is crazy that we have found us. And now we know our worth. Africa, we are rising. We are standing with a helper. But we now is a helper. Interfering with our culture. They have mimicked, they have mocked us. They stole us and they robbed us. Open names and all our options. Now take me away, let me go to a better place But this is no disgrace, no matter what we're gonna stay We're fighting our demon to battle and with all this grace No cracking in the skin, even when we are turning gray Hands lifted in the sky, dreams are no longer delayed They have to see what we have to offer We refuse to be slaves to the land that we're freed from 
Black we are spotless, we are clean immaculate Women, men and children, we are rising from the grave Let them know our power, let them know we are in slaves Mercy from the Father, cause we don't wanna be late We're taking up our crosses, straight cross for what He gave They're looking at our skin and thinking when and what He made But they don't know where from all of the things originate We're waking up as Africans, we're serving them our plates When you think you're a mess, just remember 